so um hello everyone thank you very much for attending this uh online seminar on soundscapes uh what we can do is i kind of start with an introduction about uh the project and about our speaker today francesco Letta. and in the meantime people can join us okay so um, this uh, online seminar is organized uh, by the Arsonsky project as part of uh, our seminar series. Um, my name is Lydia Alvarez, and I'm going to start with the introduction of the project. Um, the Arsonsky uh, project is an ARC project which deals with sound, rock art, and in sacred, uh, sacred landscapes, trying to determine how sound and these uh, components interact all together. Uh, with this in mind, uh, Margarita Diaz Andrio, who is our uh, principal investigator, uh, brought together an um, interdisciplinary group of researchers uh, working on different uh, disciplines. Um, which are mainly archaeology, uh, ethnography, psychology, uh, acoustic engineering, and others, working uh, to study um, soundscapes and uh, acoustics in Trocard uh, places all around the world. Um, we built uh, six uh, different research uh, lines which work together in this project and um, the project started in 2018, so we have completed so far uh, uh, some field work all around the world in um, Mediterranean area, in Europe, in Siberia, in Asia, and in South Africa as well. So uh, if you are curious about our results so far, uh, I invite you to visit our website and our Facebook Facebook page where you can uh, follow our the activities and uh, publications we have so far. Um, our invited speaker today uh, is uh, Francesco Aleta. I'm so happy he accepted our invitation to be here today. Um, he is an architect um, who started to work uh, on environmental uh, acoustics and soundscapes during his PhD. And after that, uh, he continues uh, working, exploring the relationship between uh, people and everyday sound as part of different uh, international projects um, and in different countries as well, in Italy, Belgium, and uh, the UK. Um, at the moment, he's uh, a lecturer um, in Building Physics and Soulscape Institute for Environmental Design and Engineering in uh, in the uh, in London, and he, uh, among other things, he is part of the editorial uh, board of the uh, Acoustic Journal, and for more than ten years, he has been the Italian national representative of the uh, John uh, Acoustician Association. Uh, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to invite you to uh, listen to this uh, podcast. It's a monthly podcast, and um, Francesco is one of the of the uh, people involved in this. It's called uh, "The Rest Is Just Noise." It's a really good initiative to disseminate uh, soundscapes and uh, environmental sounds in urban areas, among other people. So um, today's seminar is going to be focused on soundscapes research, uh, paying special attention to the normative framework and standardization of definitions and procedures and methods uh, for data collection and analysis in uh, soundscapes. So Francesco, it's all yours now. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lydia. You are too kind. Um, I'm going to share the screen now, and I'm going to go to presentation mode. Can you just confirm for a second you see my screen and you hear me well? Yes, all good. Okay. 
Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, again, I'd like to uh, thank uh, you, Lydia and Margarita, for this uh, very nice invitation. I'm very pleased to be here uh, with you today, at least remotely. I'm based in London, where I'm uh, connected from at the moment. As Lydia mentioned, I'm going to give you um, an overview about um, where we are uh, with the standardization in soundscape research and practice. Um, what this implies for methods for data collection for again collecting people uh, collecting uh, data about how people perceive uh, sound environments and why this is important for uh, potentially prediction models for planning and, and design and where we are with the uh, implementation of such an approach uh, into potentially regulatory and norm normative uh, frameworks so just to give you some context um, uh, this is data from the WHO, uh, the World Health Organization. It's estimated that uh, approximately 80 million um, EU citizens in uh, EU member states suffer from um, levels of noise that are too high or potentially uh, harmful for health. Uh, noise as an environmental pollutant is a huge social cost and transportation noise alone is estimated to be in the 0.2 to 2% 2 uh, range uh, of the gross domestic product uh, across member states of the European Union. It's usually very high on the list of environmental complaints. It has a number of uh, negative effects and potentially negative health outcomes uh, dealing with uh, hearing, uh, speech, sleep deprivation, and other cardiovascular uh, conditions. However, uh, reducing sound levels is not always feasible. So for the reasons I mentioned above, uh, the approach that regulators have is uh, typically to reduce the, the, the noise levels, uh, no matter what. Uh, but this is not always feasible and cost effective. Uh, and moreover, uh, the noise annoyance, which is one of the main uh, perceptual outcomes of being exposure, exposed to noise, only depends on 30% um, on, on the physics of the actual signal. Uh, for this reason, there is a general agreement and understanding that uh, an alternative or complementary approach uh, would be beneficial, and this is where the soundscape idea and the soundscape concepts come into play. Where do we come from with this uh, soundscape idea? Um, here on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, you have a picture uh, from the World Soundscape Project, uh, where um, Canadian researchers, um, uh, led by uh, Murray uh, Schaefer, uh, basically started to uh, question uh, the the idea that decibel as, as a unit would be um, representative of how human experience um, a sound environment and uh, introduced the idea that we need a more qualitative approach, uh, need to make differences between uh, sources that are uh, wanted uh, versus unwanted, um, uh, high fidelity soundscapes as opposed to low fidelity soundscapes and so on. Um, and this uh, idea was also... Uh, developing in a, in a more uh, urban uh, studies uh, context. And uh, on the right hand side here, you have um, a figure from a paper by uh, Southworth in, in the late 60s. Uh, and they started question uh, in, in an era where, you know, planning and design was dominated by vision. Uh, they started question how uh, cities should sound like rather than just um, look like. In terms of uh, academic understanding of the concept and scientific literature, I often share this graph um, to show uh, basically the growth of soundscape studies in, in scientific publishing. Um, so you can see over the past two decades, uh, the number of items which uh, relate to soundscape, broadly understood as a concept, uh, was growing over time. And I've highlighted three, uh, what I consider to be three milestones in this in this uh, period. Um, in 2002, we have the publication of the Environmental Noise Directive by the European uh, Council, uh, which for the first time introduced the idea of quiet areas and this uh, more um, perceptual uh, aspect of, of noise environments. Um, in 2008, the International Organization for Standardization introduced um, established Working Group 54 on uh, perceptual analysis of soundscape, where they started to work on uh, possible definitions and uh, a general theoretical framework uh, for this soundscape approach. Um, and then in 2014, um, the um, 
European Environment Agency published a very important technical report on best uh, practice and guidance for the management and identification of quiet areas, uh, which was somehow uh, triggered by the fact that the 2002 normative uh, introduced the idea of quiet areas, but then didn't provide a lot of um, details and guidelines on how to actually manage those. Uh, and so you can see that basically there, there is a steep increase uh, kind of as, as, a, as a consequence of um, each of these events uh, occurring over time. As I said, uh, there is a standardization process uh, currently ongoing. Um, in 2014, uh, the Working Group 54 published the first part of the standard, uh, which again, considering that um, the, the, the Working Group was established in 2008, it took six years to agree on uh, basic definitions and, and concept and a theoretical framework. This is a very short uh, document, something like six or eight pages, but very dense in content. Um, and then there was another attempt, there was an attempt at passing uh, the, the part two of this standard about the data collection uh, methods and requirements. Uh, so basically how to measure soundscape, uh, which was um, very, um, hotly debated, I would say, uh, and uh, required actually further discussion. And the document was eventually published as technical specification in 2018. Um, as you can see here, uh, ISO 12913 part two, where the guidelines report methods for collecting both objective and subjective data on perception of sound environments. Uh, one year later, in 2019, uh, the working group published this uh, part three of the standard, again, as technical specifications, and this is about data analysis. So this document is basically telling us how to process and report the data that has been collected according to part two. And um, just an update, there is uh, currently, uh, the, the working group is currently working on a fourth part of the standard which will be, again, likely published as technical specification, and it's about soundscape design and intervention. And this would ideally uh, close the circle and, and the loop uh, in a way, because once we have collected data and analyzed data, how then we move forward uh, to implement this and to inform, uh, um, basically, design decisions. Because of this standardization process, um, I would say that uh, policymakers are starting to listen in a way, and um, the concept is picking up in some key policy uh, documents. Uh, I've reported a few examples here in, in two, um, if, uh, from the last decade or so. So you have in 2014, the document I mentioned before, uh, the Good Practice Guide on Quiet Areas published by the Environmental European Environment Agency. So in this document, uh, which again has no um, prescriptive or normative nature, it's just guidelines. Uh, the concept of soundscape is introduced uh, potentially for the first time at policy level. Um, and um, the, the, the EAA uh, acknowledges the importance of, of the soundscape approach for the characterization and identification of quiet areas. Uh, another very important document in 2018 is published by um, the Welsh government and as part of the Environmental Noise Directive, you may know that every five years, um, member states are supposed to uh, publish a noise action plans. So in 2018, in the last round, and uh, the Welsh government is actually doing the same for the next round, they for the first time introduced this definition in the title itself of the document, and they named it the, the Noise and Soundscape Action Plan. So this is a very important uh, acknowledgement of the approach uh, because it basically uh, implies that any practitioner uh, working in Wales um, would need to somehow take into account the, the specificities of, um, of uh, soundscape perception. And uh, the Welsh government is somehow um, uh, continuing in this, uh, in this commitment. And this is a document, again, a policy document about uh, building better places, some kind of guidelines for uh, placemaking and the built environment that was published uh, just um, at the peak of the pandemic, actually. So very important uh, moment uh, for reflection about how our places and communities should, should sound like. Uh, and again, uh, to praise a bit more the, the Welsh government, they are currently uh, trying to pass legislation um, in, in the Welsh uh, parliament 
uh, with this uh, bill, the Environment, Air, Quality and Soundscape uh, Wales Bill, which uh, if approved would become uh, an act. Uh, and this would legally place a duty on Welsh ministers to publish a national soundscape strategy. Uh, by including soundscapes within the proposals in the bill, Welsh ministers uh, would aim to further align noise, soundscape and air quality policy, which often goes, which often go hand in hand, as you can imagine. And in the UK, at least through this bill, uh, Wales would be the first uh, part of the UK to formally include the, the soundscape ideas and the soundscape approach into legislation. So this is a very important uh, moment. Now, we have talked a bit about the, uh, the definition, the part one and the definitions and the framework. So what is the actual definition provided in the part one of the standard? So in the 2014 document, uh, part one uh, of the ISO 12913, soundscape is actually defined as an acoustic environment as perceived and experienced and or understood by a person or people in context. Now, if we look closely at this definition, uh, we may uh, figure out that the, the concept of soundscape is slightly different from the idea of acoustic environment. Uh, people tend to use this uh, as equivalent terms, but Again, if we stick to this definition, uh, they are possibly not. Um, so in a way we could see, we could look at the acoustic environment as the physical phenomenon, uh, like all the sound sources happening at a given point in time and space, uh, while the soundscape is the perceptual construct. So it, in, in a way it implies a human uh, perception, uh, a human listener in this case. So if we imagine this as an input-output uh, uh, system, uh, we may say that the acoustic environment is the physical input. Then we have a black box, which is somehow our perception. And the output of this process is the perceptual uh, construct, is the soundscape. Um, again, from part one of the standard, context is a really important uh, concept. Um, and the standard defines it as um, the construct including the interrelationships between person and activity and place in space and time. Uh, the context may influence soundscape through uh, the auditory sensation, the interpretation of the auditory sensation, and the responses to the acoustic environment. So if we look at this um, uh, concept uh, schematized in, in, in this diagram, uh, we may say that the starting point is the context, and then we have, as we said, the sound sources, the physical phenomenon uh, happening and generating a physical acoustic environment. Because we have people there, we have an auditory sensation, which is then interpreted, and people will potentially react with uh, behaviors to that. And behaviors, in turn, have the potential to physically affect uh, the context. So that's why this is represented in this uh, loop uh, scheme. As a side effect, or um, um, uh, potential output of this of this process, we have what the uh, standard defines as outcomes. And outcomes, according to the standard, part one, are overall long-term consequence uh, facilitated or enabled by the acoustic environment. Uh, this may include attitudes, beliefs, um, judgments, experiences, health, well-being, and quality uh, of life, as well as reduced co social costs for society. These are all valid and uh, possible outcomes. And I've reported here a table from uh, a paper by um, Brown, Gesslan, and, and uh, Kang in 2011 in Applied Acoustics, where they list some uh, potential outcomes. And you will see if you read and if you uh, browse through the list that there are things like uh, satisfaction, sense of control, tranquility, excitement. Um, so this is just to highlight that, again, uh, sound levels in many of these possible outcomes would not be a meaningful descriptor or indicator for um, many, many of these uh, outcomes. So in terms of uh, data collection, uh, this is a, a diagram I generated to try to map the structure of uh, the technical specifications, the part two of the standard, which uh, I have to say is not uh, extremely easy to navigate. And that, that, that's the reason for having this kind of um, uh, scheme. Um, the most interesting part, of course, is the data collection, where the technical specifications introduce the, the sound walk and the questionnaires, which are described in Annex C, which, interestingly enough, is an informative document, is not uh, a normative document. But uh, yet, it describes a possible data collection methods um, as per the, the, the standard. 
And basically the standard, the technical specifications offer three options, uh, three possible methods or protocols, uh, namely method A, method B, and method C. Method A and method B are to be used on site in combination with Soundworks, and uh, they are basically protocols, instruments for questionnaires. Um, so again, they focus on uh, in situ uh, in situ assessment of the soundscape. Uh, and then you have method C, which is mostly meant for off-site uh, data collection, and it refers to narrative interviews. So a much more qualitative method with in-depth uh, interviews and questions. Um, there is no clear consensus on when any of these methods uh, or alternative protocols should be used. Um, triangulation theory would, would suggest that ideally we would use uh, more, uh, more than one uh, in the same context. But again, as a rule of thumb, uh, we, I would say that narrative interviews are very good for um, an exploratory stage of, of the study um, where, for instance, the researcher is not necessarily familiar with the context and needs to understand what are the underlying elements of, of the soundscape, uh, while sound walks are, are conducted on site with groups of uh, experts uh, who could be local residents or trained um, um, soundscapers or acoustic researchers or, or alike. Uh, just to have a look at how the method A actually looks like, uh, so you have different categories of questions uh, which uh, participants are presented to, with, and they have to answer on each of those according to some uh, Likert scales. So you have these categorical uh, five-point scales. So the first category is about uh, sound sources. So uh, when, in the context of the sound work, participants arrive at the spot, uh, they are presented with the first questions about sound sources, and these are uh, about sound sources categories. So to what extent do you presently hear the following types of sounds? Uh, and there are these four categories, traffic noise, other noises, sounds from human beings, uh, natural sounds, with some examples of sound sources. And for each of these categories, um, participants are expected to answer on this Likert scale, assessing the dominance of such sound sources, ranging from not at all to dominates completely. So once you have that, basically, you may somehow reconstruct um, like a sound sources profile, uh, uh, the sound uh, footprint in a way of, of, of a place, which again is something that uh, instrumental measure would not be able to reveal. Uh, and then moving towards a, a more um, assessment and uh, emotional scales, you have uh, another set of questions uh, here on the right hand side of the slide. So. Uh, for each of the eight scales below, to what extent do you agree or disagree that the present surrounding sound environment is pleasant, chaotic, vibrant, uneventful, calm, annoying, eventful, uh, monotonous? And for each of these scales, a participant may answer ranging from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And then at the bottom, you have two very general questions about overall uh, soundscape quality. The first one is something like a more holistic question. So overall, how would you describe the present surrounding sound environment, um, considering all things together, ranging from very good to very bad? And the other question is about appropriateness, which uh, is a very tricky dimension because appropriateness does not necessarily imply uh, good quality. It may simply uh, signify that the soundscape that the participant is experiencing is somehow expecting and matching uh, the context, uh, be it the visual context or some other uh, physical environment context. So these eight scales um, that the standard uh, refers to are not random. Uh, they actually come from this uh, circumplex uh, model uh, proposed by Axelson and, and colleagues, which is uh, actually an adaptation of a very well-known uh, model in environmental psychology, the valence arousal model, uh, but here adapted in the context of soundscape uh, research. According to this model, uh, we may be able to describe any soundscape um, on this uh, bidimensional space, uh, which they call the circumplex model of, of soundscape. Um, where you have a first uh, component, a first horizontal dimension, which is the, the balance dimension, uh, where on, on the right extreme, you have pleasant soundscapes, and on the left extreme, on the negative extreme, you have annoying soundscapes. And then you have uh, orthogonal uh, dimension to this balance one, which is uh, what Axelson called 
the eventfulness dimension. So this um, dimension is, because it's orthogonal to the pleasantness one, is uh, neutral in terms of balance. So it basically only tell us whether there are things happening uh, in, in the soundscape. And in a way, we can derive additional uh, descriptors from these two main dimensions. So if a soundscape is both pleasant and eventful, we may define it as exciting or vibrant. Uh, if a soundscape is both pleasant and uneventful, we may describe, uh, describe it as calm, restorative, or tranquil. And then if we move on the negative region of this model, if a soundscape is both annoying and uneventful, we may define it as monotonous, boring. And moving up the eventfulness scale, if a soundscape is both um, annoying and eventful, we may define it as uh, chaotic. So again, uh, focusing for a moment about the possible positive outcomes in the positive region of, uh, of in the pleasantness region of the model, uh, we may see that possible positive outcomes are both vibrant soundscapes or calm soundscapes. And we could imagine that, again, sound levels could not necessarily be the same. So again, a decibel only uh, based metric or description of the sound environment would not capture uh, these possible, possible positive outcomes. Now, of course, we have to start from the idea that this is the standard, right? So these concepts may be uh, uh, relatively hard to understand uh, in English already. Uh, so one of the first challenges uh, of this is, of course, trying to adapt this to different uh, regional uh, and country uh, contexts. Because if the idea of standard is that uh, you know data should be uh, comparable, uh, measurements should be comparable across sites and across different samples of populations, uh, what happens then if we take this uh, English protocol basically and try to apply it to, to other countries in non-English uh, speaking uh, regions. And this is the first barrier uh, about you know, how we understand these uh, dimensions. Um, there are some that may be easier to grasp, like the calmness one, people, different people in different parts of the world may, may or may not agree on what calmness means. Uh, but some other concepts may, may, may be slightly more complicated, like uh, the vibrancy or the eventfulness one, which is already challenging in Italy, in, in English, sorry. Um, so for this reason, actually, we started an international collaboration, which is aimed at translating, uh, as a first step, this method uh, into different languages. And we have uh, 19 working groups uh, active at the moment. Uh, and these are just examples of languages that we are working with uh, to try to provide equivalent uh, descriptors for these uh, soundscape scales with the idea of uh, validating this with standardized uh, listening experiments and hopefully, you know, uh, contribute to uh, widespread use of this also in non-English speaking uh, regions. And here, uh, I mean, uh, as a way of paying tribute to my uh, hosts in Barcelona, you can see me uh, humbling, trying uh, to sell the concept also to our um, uh, Catalan colleagues during the Acousticat uh, uh, conference, which took place uh, a couple of uh, years ago. Anyhow, um, this was method A. Uh, another method which is uh, presented in uh, in the standard in technical specifications in part two is method B. Uh, so you see it's a slightly different instrument with slightly different scales. Uh, the focus here is more on loudness and unpleasantness and appropriateness. And then there are some other more um, general questions about the desire to visit the place again. Um, and then some more unstructured um, questions about the sound sources that participants could identify on site and a very uh, broad and generic question uh, to the participant, what's going through your mind? So you see, this is slightly more qualitative and uh, possibly requires some additional um, processing in terms of, of uh, data processing. And again, because the standard, the technical specifications do not really um, specifying in which cases we should use uh, which protocol. Uh, there's also been research going on uh, about uh, you know, testing the actual compatibility of, of the methods. And um, this is something that the working group may want to uh, consider in further uh, revisions of, of the standard and the technical specifications. 
when it comes to the analysis, um, as you see for method B on the uh, top uh, bottom right hand side, um, you see for the scales, basically for the assessment of the sound environment, uh, the, the, the researcher should assign uh, values ranging from one to five, and then to measure the central tendency, uh, uh, calculate the arithmetic mean, and for, as a measure of dispersion, the standard deviation. And then from, for sound sources recognition, it's basically a ranking uh, because the question was about, uh, please list the first eight um, sound sources that you can notice in the sound environment. Uh, the eight scales of method A require some more uh, articulated uh, processing, but they are quite helpful in visualizing then the soundscapes on the circumplex model we described before. So you can see that basically from this eight, from the scores of the eight individual uh, dimensions, annoying, calm, chaotic, eventful, uh, monotonous, pleasant, event, uneventful, and vibrant, uh, with these equations on the left-hand side, you can uh, basically apply a trigonometric transformation and then reduce the scores of the eight scales to um, a point, uh, to two coordinates of pleasantness and eventfulness that then allow you to effectively pin a single uh, soundscape assessment on, on the model. So this is basically a representation of what is happening here. So you have, you know, on the left-hand side, the scores uh, for each of the scales. So these, the red and the blue ones are two random, uh, randomly generated soundscape assessments of two participants in, in, on, on a site. Um, and so you have the scores ranging from one to five, as I said, for the Likert scale. And then you apply the equations uh, for transformating those scores into two coordinates, as I've shown in the previous slide. And then you can reduce these two points on the C-complex model. And so you see, this is quite effective in visualizing where the soundscape assessment is on the model, uh, especially if we keep in mind the, the quadrant, the vibrant, calm, monotonous, uh, chaotic dimensions we have described before. Uh, and then if we repeat this enough times, then, say, for instance, uh, with 100 uh, soundscape assessments. This is an example of what we did uh, in London, in a site in Russell Square in central London on the uh, top left. Uh, basically, we, we were on site with our questionnaire, with our method A protocol, and we approached uh, 100 members of the public over a period of a couple of hours. Uh, and then we reduced those eight scores for each participant to the uh, B-dimensional uh, representation, and then we plot all uh, 100 of them. And then from there, you see that interesting, uh, interesting things start to happen. You can kind of uh, plot uh, densities uh, and probability functions for, for these uh, assessments. And while a single assessment of a single person may not be representative, if you repeat this enough times, like 100 times or 200 times, you kind of capture the collective experience of, uh, of a soundscape. So we may say that collectively, the soundscape of Russell Square uh, on that day was assessed as generally pleasant. And then for some people, uh, slightly more vibrant, for some people, slightly more uh, calm. And that may be related to the emergence of sound sources like uh, vibrant ones, for instance, tend to be associated with the presence of people. Uh, children playing or water features, which are present indeed on site, while uh, calm, calmness dimension may be more associated with more natural sound sources like uh, bird song uh, or uh, the sound of wind rustling through the uh, through the leaves and so on. And it's also useful if you want to compare different sites or you want to in any ways stratify your your sample. Um, into different groups and different clusters, and it's quite effective in, in seeing uh, this. For instance, um, the, the one on the bottom right is uh, the same site uh, for Russell Square, but basically the sample is, is split by uh, assessments that were gathered in a condition of uh, below 63 decibels and above uh, 63 uh, decibels. So you see that uh, when, when the soundscape is quieter, in a way, uh, that the assessments are always pleasant. Um, so this is what the, 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 the ISO more or less uh, recommends. Uh, so we may question whether that's enough. And actually, if we look at literature, we, we can see clearly that there is um, much more uh, than just the standard going on uh, in scientific publications. So uh, I tried to uh, 
summarize this into this diagram. Um, so basically, if we think about the acoustic environment, there are different ways we could experience that. We could um, experience that on site, for instance, with sound walks. Um, and then we may have also laboratory experiments, experiments which actually the soundscape the standard does not cover in a great uh, detail. Uh, but they are equally valid. And uh, then in terms of methods for assessing those soundscapes, we may well have laboratory experiments, uh, but we could also have a soundscape that is simply recalled in memory. Uh, and that, that's what happens, for instance, uh, with the narrative interviews. So especially if we take them off site, people, participants may be thinking about soundscape, uh, sound environments that they were exposed to that were in the past. And again, those are still valid uh, representations of, of a soundscape. And for each of these uh, approaches, we have possible methods, and then we need to have, uh, of course, the right tools to actually uh, capture and, and measure those uh, perceptions. So one might ask, okay, but why do we need this individual soundscape data overall? And my answer, at least, is that they are helpful to define descriptors and indicators for the human perception of the acoustic environment. So what are these then uh, soundscape indicators and descriptors, and are they the same thing? Well, we believe they're not. Uh, so in a way, we may describe descriptors as measures of how people perceive the acoustic environment. So they are related to a uh, perceptual dimension, and this could be uh, for instance, uh, calmness, vibrancy, pleasantness, as we said before, these are all valid soundscape descriptors. And soundscape indicators are, on the other hand, objective metrics uh, that we use to predict, to anticipate the value of a soundscape descriptor. To give a very basic example from psychoacoustics, um, we have uh, the sound level as measured in decibel, uh, described by L, and then we have uh, perceived loudness of, of, of a pure uh, tone um, described by uh, C in this case. So if we look at the exponential relationship that we have here, uh, we may see that basically given uh, an objective metric, the level in this case, we are able to describe with a decent amount of uh, decent reliability uh, a perceptual outcome, which is in this case the perceived loudness. So this is what we are then trying to achieve also with soundscape uh, dimensions. So we may have models that uh, can predict calmness or vibrancy and so on. So the next question then is how do we select meaningful soundscape descriptors? Soundscape concerns how people perceive experience or understand the acoustic environment. Therefore, it's a requirement that soundscape descriptors should provide a measure of at least one of these aspects. Uh, and then soundscape descriptors may either refer to single dimensions of soundscape, like the calmness or the vibrancy, or uh, even to uh, soundscape quality more holistically. Now, people have uh, did, did try this in the past, and this kind of, of models for predicting soundscape quality as a whole are usually less effective and successful for the very reason that, as we said, soundscape assessment is very much contextual. So it's unlikely that we will find the soundscape quality descriptor that can capture, for instance, the quality of vibrant soundscapes as opposed to the quality of uh, equally good as uh, the soundscape quality of calm soundscapes. So this is something to keep in mind. And here, this is a review of, um, again, uh, studies that have attempted this. Uh, so in this list, you have uh, models, prediction models, either linear models or nonlinear models, uh, where um, researchers were trying to predict a perceptual uh, outcome. You can see, for instance, eventfulness, pleasantness, tranquility, uh, based only on uh, measurable objective indicators. Uh, and why is this uh, important? I'm going to give you an example here for, uh, this is a very um, um, well-known model uh, published by um, colleagues in the UK. Um, Robert Fiesen, uh, Greg Watts, and Kirill Oroshenkov, uh, they called it a tranquility rating prediction tool. So what they did was basically gathering people in a lab and um, exposing them to different uh, scenes, audiovisual scenes, uh, and asking them to assess the perceived tranquility, how tranquil they, um, the participants felt that those uh, audiovisual scenes would feel, make them feel. And then they calculated some objective metrics for those audiovisual stimuli. 
and specifically they calculated both the visual uh, metrics for both the visual components and the auditory components. And then they derived this uh, linear model, uh, which is represented in this uh, linear equation at the top of the slide, where tranquility, which is again a perceptual outcome, uh, can be described uh, with this relationship that includes uh, effectively sound levels, so auditory dimension, and the percentage of green features that are visible uh, in the space, in the, in the scene. So they did this with a very basic approach, like uh, putting a grid on the picture and literally calculating the percentage of green features uh, in, the, in the scene. And with this model, then you see on, on this graph, uh, you can see, for instance, that you have on the horizontal axis, the sound level, and on the vertical axis, the perceived tranquility rating. And then the three uh, data series represent three different percentages of green uh, features in the scene. So you can see clearly that, for instance, if we stop at 60 decibels and we are in a context where there is 0% of green visible in the scene, we will have a predicted tranquility rate of something like 10%. Uh, if we keep the level, the sound level fixed and we increase the amount of green that we can see in the space by, say, 50%, the tranquility, the perceived tranquility will increase to 30%. And then if, again, if we keep the 60 decibel levels and we increase the amount of green to 100%, so we are totally immersed in a green scene, the tranquility, the perceived tranquility increases again to something like 50 or 60%. So you can see that this, uh, by simply changing a visual feature of the space, we're effectively modulating uh, soundscape perception. And you can see this, that this becomes, you can see clearly here, this becomes very useful tool uh, for potentially designing and, you know, anticipating how people will perceive. So this is a recent trend in, in soundscape research where we are effectively trying to engineer uh, a soundscape perception with this kind of, of models and relationships. And again, you may attempt that for different dimensions. This is an example from our own research where we try to develop uh, a predictive model uh, of vibrancy as a perceptual outcome based on objective metrics. So we effectively run the same experiment as the, uh, the uh, Watts, uh, Fies and Toroshenkov group and uh, came up with predictors, objective predictors of perceived vibrancy. So in this case, you can see that the roughness of the signal and the fluctuation strength of the signal and the loudness of the signal, as well as the music, uh, the presence of music in the signal, signal would be strong predictors. And in terms of visual uh, factors, the presence of people, uh, like less people would lead to less vibrant uh, soundscapes, uh, while more people would lead to um, uh, more vibrant uh, soundscapes. Uh, these were all objective predictors of a perceptual uh, soundscape outcome. And again, the importance of having the right descriptor for the right uh, context cannot be uh, highlighted more. As I said, we have to find the right dimension for the right application. If we use the tranquility rating tool for assessing the soundscape quality of, I don't know, La Rambla in Barcelona, that wouldn't make sense because maybe we need a vibrancy model for, for that context because that's the best proxy, the best dimension that would capture the meaning of the place uh, and describe more effectively the quality of, of, of the context, the soundscape quality of the context. And I've given here an example from um, a colleague, uh, Pamela Jordan, and she's focusing especially on uh, historical soundscapes. So you can see clearly that, uh, so this is a case study at the Berlin uh, Wall Memorial, and uh, the range of uh, uh, descriptors proposed is uh, quite different from the ones that you find in the soundscape standard. And the reason for that is that maybe if you are working on a historical soundscape, a soundscape of the past, uh, using those dimensions of uh, pleasantness, uh, calmness, uh, vibrancy may not be meaningful, and maybe we need to find uh, more suitable descriptors. And um, Pamela Jordan here is proposing something like uh, meaningful, uh, authentic, again, appropriate, uh, but also uh, um, you know, significant, acceptable, all these kind of uh, descriptors are much more meaningful in the context of historical soundscapes, for instance. So I'm moving slightly towards uh, the conclusion of this, and then we may ask ourselves, what are the current priorities and challenges uh, for soundscape research? 
um, we run a number of um, expert interviews in the past uh, where we basically asked uh, relatively younger uh, researchers how they would see the soundscape area, the soundscape research field developing over the next um, maybe 10, 15 years. Uh, what would be the, the challenges and the priorities, the research priorities, the agenda that needs to be addressed. And then uh, we had something like 12 uh, soundscape researchers, experts in the field, and then we identified some themes uh, that they perceived to be priorities. Um, and one of, one of them is, of course, this gap that still exists between academia and, and practice. So soundscape as a research uh, topic is now relatively well defined, uh, but then we need practitioners to engage more with this. Uh, then there are some questions about where the soundscape framework and soundscape theory should be applied. Uh, does it make sense to apply it to uh, indoor environments as well as outdoor environments, uh, to historical and archaeological contexts? Um, these are all open uh, questions. Uh, these expert in, uh, interviewees uh, reported on the necessity to explore multisensory interactions in soundscape research. So how vision is affecting sound perception, how smell, uh, and so on. Uh, and then we also need to kind of, um, you know, engage more with uh, emerging technologies. Uh, I mean, technologies that are not so, so much emerging anymore, but well established like oralizations, as well as augmented realities, and uh, reflect more on how uh, we can use these tools to make soundscape research uh, progress. And then as last point, I just want to give you a very, very quick um, overview of uh, projects I'm working on at the moment. As I said, this is the Soundscape Attributes uh, Translation Project, SATP. So this is a kind of attempt to validate the methods, uh, the protocols of method A in different um, regions and countries of the world. This is a map with all our partners around the globe. Um, we have recently started uh, with some colleagues in uh, Hong Kong. Um, a project called Multimodal Hong Kong, where we are uh, trying to document uh, sensory cultural heritage uh, through uh, soundscape and smellscape um, techniques in uh, places of historical balance in Hong Kong, uh, like uh, temples, uh, street food uh, markets, and, and, and other um, historically meaningful sites. Uh, we are also uh, conducting some research in um, UK national parks. Uh, this was basically dictated by the fact that, again, the sounds, we, we focus a lot on the, with the soundscape standard, at least on the, the quality of urban uh, context, but what about the applicability of these uh, protocols and dimensions to natural environments? Um, and so, for instance, in the United States, there is much more research on that, which, for instance, for the UK context is more limited. So we are trying to uh, organize um, workshops and data collection sessions also in UK national parks. And uh, even in a slightly more extreme environments. So this is a project that we are running in collaboration with uh, University of Trento and uh, Silence in Quota, our colleague. Um, Simone Torresin, where again, we try to uh, characterize soundscapes of um, uh, these um, places of natural uh, beauty, like the Dolomites in this case, and there was also a parallel project run in, in uh, Scotland, uh, supported by the UCL Global Engagement Fund, uh, where again, we are trying to uh, explore and test the applicability of this uh, ISO standard techniques in uh, other contexts, basically. As a take-home message, I would say that uh, soundscape studies are, of course, growing as a research field. Uh, so the body of scientific literature published over the past two decades uh, kind of reflects that quite well. Uh, the standardization um, attempt is still in progress, and we have to say it has contributed a lot to the development of the disciplines. But as I said, there are more challenges to be addressed, like the translation or also other technical challenges. And then prediction models and possibly new metrics um, are indeed required if we want the soundscape approach to become an effective design strategy and then have uh, more impact in the management of the built environment. So to speak more to the design and practitioners uh, side, if you wish. And that's it 
for me. I hope I managed to stay within the 40 minutes that I was given, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Francesco, for this uh, amazing presentation. It's incredible how you uh, summarize all this information and present it in a very clear way. Um, uh, do you have any questions, anyone? Shall I start it? <laughs> um, as you know, as part of the Art Soulscape project, um, we have been uh, studying so far uh, the acoustic environment of the uh, rock art places we have been uh, working with, but we are also conducting some uh, research in terms of uh, soundscape. Uh, we have some bias here, let's say like that. So as you can imagine, put in context something from uh, prehistorical times is kind of uh, challenging. But uh, we are uh, uh, using different uh, methodologies to do that. Uh, Samantha and uh, Raquel are here. Maybe they have a question regarding this method later. But I would like to ask you first, um, having in mind natural uh, soundscapes, as uh, natural sites, as uh, the ones we are working with, uh, I wonder uh, how limiting you think is don't have in long-term uh, observations uh, when uh, ass assessing uh, soundscape descriptors and also indicators. Uh, can you please uh, elaborate a bit more? Sorry, what do you mean not having long-term uh, observations? Yeah, because uh, sometimes it's difficult to access these sites more than once. So uh, we sometimes have recordings for just, you know, one day or one period of the time in the year. Yeah. Um, are you uh, concerned about the human assessment of that or the uh, the uh, like acoustic monitoring like with devices or uh, both of them because you know as as we are dealing with natural sites sometimes we go I don't know we, we go to the sites in the summer so it's a completely different uh, soundscape that we have in uh, winter for example depending on the part of the world you are are working with at that time yeah. so uh in the in the standards you normally have these recommendations you have to monitor uh for a long period of time but sometimes for us it's just not possible yeah no i totally agree and um in a way we also experienced the very similar issues with this uh, uh in quota one of the last slides i i showed uh, about the the sound work on the dolomites uh, so this mountain region in northern Italy. Um, so we really wanted to test the standard to its extreme and we literally had the person caring because the standard is effectively requiring that, right? That you have a group of people who go on a sound walk and then they have their questionnaire and then you have exactly. a very nice uh, expensive dummy head to <laughs> conduct uh, binaural measurements. And because it was a one-off, in this case, we did it so the group did it, uh, and we literally had the person carrying this uh, the dummy head uh, for the whole four hours of the walk, uh, just because we wanted to make a case. And of course, this kind of approach is not uh, feasible or sustainable for uh, hard to reach uh, sites like the Dolomites, or I imagine the one the sites you are dealing with in the context of the art, uh, art soundscapes. Uh, project. I, I would say that I, I believe there are a few lessons to be learned from uh, the world of um, acoustic ecology and bioacoustics and uh, egoacoustics rather than, you know, urban soundscape studies. Um, because I know that, again, for the monitoring of natural environments, that, that there are now um, a lot of uh, opportunities in terms of um, re relatively inexpensive devices uh that you know are placed uh, into the wild in in natural environment where they are exposed to any kind of uh, threat from the animal world but also weather conditions and in terms of uh monitoring they are still quite effective uh so i think a lot of progress has been done over the past uh five to ten years um i'm thinking about 
again, work by uh, researchers such as uh, Alice Eldridge or Almo Farina. Uh, they are quite uh, strong now on the, the logistics of this and the hardware part of that. Um, so I would say that long, long term monitoring of natural uh, environments is less of a challenge this day. How do we then condense that into, you know, meaningful asset, soundscape assessments of those long term monitoring for uh, for the human experience? That's that's another uh, question. And I know that there are research uh, research. There is research about, uh, for instance, from from the Ghent group in Belgium, where uh, they try to develop things like that they call like acoustic or soundscape summary. So basically, when you have long-term uh, monitoring, uh, develop so long-term recordings as well. Uh, try to develop uh, algorithms that uh, effectively condense and summarize uh, like long recordings into short, uh, uh, what they call acoustic summaries of of a place, which can then, I believe, be uh, more uh, practically used for assessments from, from people in listening experiments, for instance, um, or in this kind of data collection, data collection with people. Um, so I think that could be a, a way forward. If, if that's what you had in mind, unless I got your question completely wrong. No, that's well one, one of the, of the sites. So if you think it's worth it to have long-term uh, recordings at these sites, it, it, I mean, also, which do you think are the limitations if we only have just like punctual recordings just for one short period of time? I mean, of course, if you have a single measurement in, in, in a point in time, you're not able to capture a seasonal variations or even daily variations within a day night uh, cycle, uh, which I would assume in a, in a natural environment are possibly even more uh, important than in an urban environment. Uh, so yeah, that's certainly a, a limitation. I, I I think that yeah, people are now pushing on this idea of nodes that are uh, self-contained and. Uh, yeah, self-contained and uh, basically batteries operated for long-term monitoring. As I said, the challenge then for our, from our perspective of management, for instance, of natural areas or areas of historical interest is then how we, how do we condense uh, this into, um, into like short, meaningful um, assessments I, I would say that, that there is a limitation if, if you only have uh, yeah, single points in time, and then of course you are more vulnerable to this kind of sampling uh, bias, which is a big uh, question. Again, for urban context, that's, uh, that's also a challenge. And this is one of the reasons we are pushing for this uh, kind of large scale uh, representations and probability uh, descriptions as the ones I've shown in a way you have the same issue for urban context where you have one person filling one questionnaire at a given point of the day and then you put one pin on the c-complex model how uh, confident are we in claiming that that single soundscape assessment is representative of the soundscape of a place we are not and that's why we are pushing uh, for this kind of large-scale surveys that's why I personally believe that also the sound walk method as a whole uh, needs to be, you know, scaled up uh, because when, when, when you try to get this data, this information, and then propose it and present it to people who have to make decisions on the management of a place, they will often argue that, you know, how can you make policy decisions based on a sound walk made by 20 people. So that's why, uh, yeah, this kind of data, 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 sample, data sample size is a very uh, hot topic uh, when it comes to policy making. It's controversial. Thank you very much. 
Uh, anyone have another question? Okay. Um, Anta? Yeah. <laughs> then Pam? Sorry, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Francesco. Thank you. Um, I want. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first is regarding the study about the um, uh, the prediction of perceived vibrancy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the, my question was, how do you like select your predictors on the first time? Because you mentioned the uh, presence of people, roughness as uh, predictors uh, for the outcome perceived uh, vibrancy. How do you? How do you? uh like select them on the first place yeah so basically we had the very broad range set of uh we, we calculated a lot of stuff and then fed that uh all those all those indicators uh to uh yeah stepwise linear regression model and effectively looked for which indicators would work best so it was a yeah stepwise uh, approach in that in that case so very basic. That kind of work is already quite old these days. I'm not sure I would recommend the same approach. Uh, I would probably look for something uh, slightly more sophisticated, like multi-level uh, modeling. Or again, keep in mind that 2013, 10 years ago, we had no idea about, I mean, we have a very limited idea about what artificial uh, neural networks would look like. Uh, or what uh, machine learning uh, would look like. So when it comes to predictive models, uh, we can't you know, ignore the elephant in the room, which is again, machine learning. So why do you need this kind of models when you can have, when you can feed a lot of data to machine learning and just get uh, soundscape perception outcomes from, from, from a machine learning based model? Uh, this is true. On the other hand, what the point I would like to make about linear regressions or multi-level uh, prediction uh, models is also that they are more transparent uh, as opposed to a machine learning or a neural network where you, you have the input, you have the output, you don't really know what's going on uh, in the middle. And for this reason, designers do not particularly like it, I believe. So when you have a transparent model, like a linear model, you, you try something, you see that something is not working, you change a model, you change a, a factor and you observe the, uh, the change. So it, it's more of a design friendly uh, in a way. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, that, that was our strategy back then. Uh, keep in mind that, as I said, this is now a vintage, uh, vintage study. Um, yeah, sorry. And, and the other question was? Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, my other question. Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, that obviously we need to adapt um, the descriptors to the context in our case of historical soundscapes. Yeah. And I wanted to ask, like, how would you do that? Because we run a listening test um, this year that in which we ask people to describe uh, like the differences they perceive between uh, sound uh, we convolve with uh, the, the acoustics we recorded in different uh, rock art sites. Mm -hmm. And then we like uh, classified them using a text mining uh, approach. And I wanted to ask if you think this is a good a starting point or if you would uh, do something different because um, there is a, like a lot of literature in well as you described in the in urban soundscapes but not so much in these particular uh, places thanks yeah no in terms of developing scales specifically for um, historical soundscapes or places of uh, cultural heritage or historical violence. Um, I, I think I mentioned during the presentation, I, I would uh, strongly recommend the work by uh, uh, Pamela Jordan, who's been working on um, many, many uh, different uh, sites. Uh, the one I presented was about uh, the sonic, um, uh, yeah, sonic encounters at the Berlin Wall, but um, she has worked a lot also on um, more archaeological sites. 
uh, I would say. So, and again, Pamela Jordan is one of them, but there is a whole uh, bunch of folks who's uh, uh, working on that. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, Miriam Collar, which I'm, I'm sure you may be familiar with and other uh, scholars in, in Northern America and uh, Southern America. So there is literature on that and about characterizing this kind of uh, uh, acoustic environments, uh, soundscapes of the past, uh, both objectively, but also uh, subjectively. So what are the questions that are that is meaningful asking to people? Uh, and who are we asking? Uh, why are we, who are we asking those questions for? Are, do we have in mind, you know, visitors uh, of this, uh, sites of these places uh, so the user's perspective is also very important uh, to keep in mind uh, when developing new scales and new protocols okay thank you so much thank you um uh yes pam do you have a question <gasps> hello ah, i didn't <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a trap sorry <laughs> no 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 trap <laughs> that's good okay. to see you so obviously um, Pam is the Pamela Jordan I've been talking about all the time <laughs> I didn't know you would be attending sorry I... <laughs> no traps no traps but a, a pleasant surprise and yes yeah, a surprise to hear me quoted huh so um hey thank you for all of this great work it's really nice to see uh, all of the research strands you've been doing. And especially, I'm really happy about this Soundscapes Attributes Translation Project. That's really important. I'm really happy to hear that going. Um, of course, I'm gonna reduce all of my questions um, and just focus on one, which is gonna, it's gonna bring us back to the first question that you had um, when you were talking about, um, let's say the, it, it, most of what you were talking about really seems to be centered around data analysis, data gathering, um, and, and I would put that in mostly in method A of the Soundscape um, ISO standard. And I wanted to get your reaction about um, the potential of method B to answer some of your questions. Um, in Method B being a bit more qualitative, right, and having a different kind of, of data analysis than, than the quantitative um, kind of uh, mass data gathering. Okay, it, one one solution would be we get, if we work in a historic context, for instance, let's try to bring everything together. So if we work in a historic context and we only have one opportunity to do a soundscape assessment, then how do we, how do we solve the problem of only assessing at one moment? We'll have 500 people be there, which, okay, that has its own problems. Mm -hmm. The qualitative, um answer might be okay we don't have 500 people but we have 10 and they are there we bring them back over and over again um we have them be highly informed participants highly informed stakeholders in one form or another both of which carry their <laughs> their price tag in um both in terms of research and in terms of just financial capability for that so i just wanted to actually just hear your thoughts about um if you think that there are certain circumstances in which method A or method B is more appropriate, or if uh, maybe you're seeing, seeing avenues for combining them, or what the thinking is on those two methods at the moment. Yeah, to, to be honest, I don't really have a clear answer for that. I'm just reacting on, you know, a state of things where I kind of think that the, the technical specifications are somewhat confusing in not giving us more <laughs> guidance on when to use uh, what. Um, so yeah, I would, I'm not saying um, in any ways, so I don't want to establish any primacy of one method over another. And I'm not saying that again, method A is necessarily more scientifically correct. Uh, it, it's just, from my side, an observation of how the soundscape is being used. Um, and I see, um, you know, method A being used more often, both in uh, research and practice, possibly because of the visual appeal of the circumplex model, which a lot of people, I mean, architects, for instance, uh, they like a lot and try to and get, uh, get, get that along. Um, 
yeah, I, I, I uh, equally seen method B used in, in other uh, scientific studies. Um, I don't know whether, again, it's, yeah, pro probably, I mean, from my point of view, I would recommend expanding or combining those uh, to try to get a better picture. Um, what I observe now is that th th there is a bit of confusion uh, around the, the two, the use of the two methods and which can context is better. I'm not, so uh, have you personally used method B for uh, historical uh, settings? Yeah, that was my my uh, framework for the the Berlin Wall study, yeah. and that's that's my departure point for any of the other historic settings I've used. Yeah, so the the, the loudness and unpleasantness thing. Yeah, I mean, again, I I think they should probably merge be merged somehow, uh, or at least being given like unique uh, indication if if this is what we claim that the standard should should be. Um, so yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question from Danny, please. Uh, hello. Hey, Francesco. Uh, thank you so much for the, for the presentation. And I would like you, or I would like to, uh, to, to ask you about the, the, um, uh, future challenges that you talked about earlier, especially the the influence uh, of other senses in the perception of the soundscapes. Uh, because I would like to know if if it's something that is uh, completely unexplored, or if it's uh, something that has been studied already, and especially if there are studies with people with uh, disabilities, uh, like I don't know several degrees of deafness or blindness. Because I guess that for those, uh, for those people, uh, the, the experience will be really different. No? Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you for this. Uh, on on your last point, again, we go back to what are the meaningful scales that we should uh, uh, use with uh, a diverse uh, group of of people, and again, whether the 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 scales proposed in the standard are diverse enough to capture different uh, the needs and the experiences of different uh, groups of participants and the answer is probably not not yet um, on the case of visual impairment that you have uh, mentioned i believe there is some work being uh, run by um, the group in granada geronimo vida manzano and they worked in collaboration with onse the national uh, trust for uh, for the visually impaired. And again, of course, for someone who's visually impaired, the soundscaping related information is very, very, very uh, crucial. Uh, how do we approach assessments with this kind of, of groups? If the standard is the, the starting point, are those dimensions meaningful for someone who's visually impaired? Does it make sense to talk about calmness or vibrancy, or should other dimensions be uh, more uh, given more prominence, like speciality or uh, audible safety or other concepts? So again, we sometimes we tend to think about the standard as you know the end point. Uh, we should rather use it you know as a platform that we constantly try to uh, refine and and improve. Uh, to take into account different uh, needs. So yeah, on that point in particular, uh, again, I would recommend research by the Granada Research Group. And there is also research that I'm aware of uh, being carried out on this uh, soundscape assessment by visually impaired in, the, um, uh, in Indonesia, uh, Bandung Institute of Technology. Uh, and I can provide yeah references if that's useful. And of course, that there is an emerging trend also. Um, there was a very nice book recently published by um, one of the editors was John Drever about oral diversity, where they approach this by uh, different oral uh, perspectives. Uh, like not everyone will hear uh, sounds the same. So we have to take into account these uh, differences. And in terms of other uh, senses, again, 
I because we focus that so much on sound, uh, we should, uh, however, still acknowledge that, of course, uh, environmental experiences do not happen in a vacuum, and our our brains do not process uh, the environmental information uh, on a multi on a, on a unisensory basis. So, uh, I very much welcome, uh, and I'm very much interested in reading studies that take into account different sensory modalities. Um, in the early days, there was a lot of, uh, you know, interest around uh, visual and auditory interactions, possibly because of uh, a driver in the psychoacoustics uh, area. Um, I'm seeing more and more often uh, other senses uh, being considered in combination with, with sound, like uh, smell, uh, as well as haptic uh, experiences. Of, of the built environment, and I think we should uh, push more in that direction. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I think for the last question, uh, Raquel? Yes, hello. Thank you, uh, Francesco, for your talk. It was very interesting. I definitely learned a lot. And my question goes a little bit in line with what you were talking now. Um, maybe you said it and I missed it, but do you take any measurements about personality traits of the participants that fill in the circumplex model? Because, and if this is not the case, do you think it would explain some of the variability that you see in the data that you have? For example, introversion, extroversion, or seeking new experiences. And I think this, this would also help making new policies because uh, it has been shown that, for example, in Portugal, people are much more introverted compared to other countries. So I think it would be very interesting to take this into account. Yeah, thank you very much for this. It's a very important point. Um, so again, if we refer to the ISO, the ISO does uh, recommend, um, you know, characterizing uh, with some basic demographics or also um, other person-related information, but does not specify specific, like which uh, traits should be uh, characterized. Um, as part of the Soundscape Indices project, that is another ERC project led by Jiang Kang, we are running here at UCL. Uh, again, we have kind of an expanded version of the protocol where we, we try to gather a lot of information on participants. And again, keep in mind, this is like members of the public we approach in public space, it's not sound walks. So we approach someone, we ask them to fill the questionnaires. Uh, again, in our case, it's again, a combination of method A and method B, as uh, Pam was saying. Um, and then we we ask a lot of person related questions uh, like basic demographics, uh, sex, age, and so on, but also more personal factors, um, socioeconomic status uh, and other facts. When we tried to run um, analysis on that, and we have a paper published by our colleague, uh, Mercedes Erfanian, who was looking at the effect of these demographics on the uh, assessments of pleasantness and eventfulness. So what we found was that the effect was strong in statistical terms, but relatively small in size. So, uh, how to say, basically, these kind of demographic factors, according to our database and our study at least, were shown to have a, a, a statistically meaningful effect, but explain a relatively small amount of the variability in the responses, something in the region of 2 or 3%. Okay, so the next question then is, if you then want to make a case for it in policy, policy maker will ask the questions like, okay, how much does it cost to accommodate soundscape design for educational level differences or uh, age related differences, if then it only contributes to an increase of say 2% in terms of a, a vibrancy or calmness scores or whatever. So I think that all these questions are very, very interesting from a research point of view, because we need to understand the basic principles and the science underlying this. Uh, 
the environmental psychology science underlying this. But then when we talk to policymakers, they listen to different arguments. <laughs> so we have to pitch it the right way. Um, if you see what I mean. Yes, yes, completely. I understand. I mean, it's it's kind of obvious that if the small effect is small, I, the size effect is small, then it makes no sense to try to accommodate based on, on these traits. But yeah, thank you. Thank you for your response. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Francesco. This has been a very, very amazing talk and a very interesting discussion. So thank you so much again for accepting our invitation. And thank you, everyone, for attending this uh, talk, this seminar. Wonderful. Thank you very much for having me, and have a great day. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.